Um, hello, folks. My name is Carlos Fernandez. I am the executive director of AIA Nevada. I uh, did want to apologize for some of the technical difficulties here. Um, welcome to our breakout um, on IBC Chapter 8 Interior Finishes. Today, you'll be hearing from Todd Snyder from West Coast Code Consultants. Todd is a licensed structural engineer in multiple states, an ICC certified building official, and a certified building mechanical energy and accessibility plans examiner. He received his master's degree from the University of Utah in civil environmental engineering, has years of experience in the structural design of a variety of building types. He currently serves as West Coast Code Consultants Utah Region Manager and leads his team with a strong focus on quality and service to jurisdictional clients. His expertise is frequently sought out and approved ICC as an approved ICC instructor, and Todd is regularly invited to each code of classes to building official, design professional, and contractor organizations throughout the United States. He is fascinated by code in its various aspects and enjoys sharing his knowledge with others as they seek to establish safe and healthy communities for their citizen. Uh, Todd, thank you so much for your time, and I'll hand it off to you. All right, thank you, Carlos. I, let me see if I can get my slides to pop up for everybody. Uh, so I guess you have been in the classes all day online, so hopefully you're ready for even more now after the uh, lunch break and are not going to fall asleep on me. So let's pull up and share my screen here. And zoom. that there you go all right so hopefully my screen is up there if you can see it if you if you can't see something please put it in the chat and we'll get moving uh, my understanding is that any questions that you have will you can put them in at any time i do have the question and answer section open for the uh, questions if you if you have a question please type in the chat i would recommend uh, because there may be quite a few questions on today's course materials. If you have a question, type really quickly, wait. I can then dismiss that comment and pause for you to actually be able to type out a comment or question. If you want to save them till the end, that's great. We can do a little Q&A at the end, but I'd rather address them as we're on those slides. So if, if you do have any questions as we move along, please let me know. Uh, I apologize. I just now realized that the uh, I did not fix the opening slide, so it says plan review for uh, architectural plan review. That is not what we're going to be talking about today. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 8 of the IBC. So this is the actual topic of today's course, interior finishes. Now, the most important thing about today's class, it has absolutely nothing to do with anything, is that codes are really, really exciting and interesting. So what you'll see is there's a random movie quote down here at the bottom of every slide. That's probably gonna be the most entertaining part of today's class. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about today. So that's just because I enjoy movies and I like to put them there. Fair warning, if you understand every quote, you're just as nerdy as I am. And so just a quick idea. Um, let me see if I can open the chat as well in case anybody wants to put something in the chat. But just, just as we look at this, chapter eight is kind of, I'm going to say this, one of the most overlooked chapters in the IBC. And there's not a whole lot of information there. It's a very short chapter, but it's very, very critical and very important. And it often gets mis, mis, misread or not looked at or overlooked in general. So a lot of things we're going to talk about today hopefully aren't new to you, but many of them probably possibly could be. And while I'd like to say that they're going to be enforced this way, most of the time building officials miss this information or it doesn't really get seen. So, but, but please be aware as you're designing buildings and preparing buildings that there are some really important information in here. So let's just jump right into chapter eight. Again, if you have any questions, please, please put them in the chat. <clears throat> so First of all, what does it mean by interior finishes? And this is where things get kind of confusing, but here's a nice picture of a diagram. Here's a, a nice little wall. We've got a chair rail halfway up. We've got a wall base down here. We've got carpet, floor finish. We've got a painting on the wall. What we look at is going to be wall and ceiling finishes. So I don't have the ceiling up, but the finish is what is 
actually seen in the building. It's the final surface. It's not what the wall is made out of. So looking at this finished material, I can't tell if the wall behind here is a fire rated wall, if it's a wood frame wall, if it's a bearing wall, if it's a partition wall. None of that matters in chapter eight. We're just looking at the finish. The finish on this wall being paint. The finish on the ceiling might be paint. It might be acoustical ceiling tiles. That's what we're looking at finish wise. We're also going to look at floor finishes. Again, this is we're going to be looking at the carpet, not the subfloor, not the uh, wood underneath, not the concrete, not the structural plywood, metal deck, or whatever it might be. We're looking at what the finished surface is in this space. We're also going to talk a little bit about types one and two construction. Type one and two construction, the building materials inside the walls, inside the floor, inside the ceilings all have to be non-combustible. But there's a lot of the finished materials in types one and two construction which can be combustible. And so chapter eight kind of spells that out for us. And I'll be going into detail about types one and two construction and what combustible materials are permitted in those construction types. The code also has information about decorative materials and trim. It brings in some of those items as well for information purposes. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about insula insulation a little bit inside the walls, acoustical ceiling tiles. Most of today's class is going to be spent on acoustic ceiling panels. Uh, as well, it's just one section in chapter eight. There's a lot of information that's about those tiles. Some items that I want to highlight that are not, as I say, we should be concerned with some not items is this painting right here is not part of the exterior interior finish. This is furnishings. This is mobile. This is not there. It doesn't count towards the interior finish. Other things such as desks, tables, chairs, countertops, cabinets, none of those are considered finishes. Those are furnishing elements. So please be aware that there are a lot of things that we don't really regulate in the building code. All right, combustible materials. I told you the key item, one of the first things they talk about is combustible materials inside these buildings, and they are permitted for any type of finished material, including walls, ceiling, floors, and other interior surfaces. So here's an interior finish on a building. I've got wood trim around a door. I've got wood paneling coming up. I've got some wood uh, crown molding up here. And this is actually really old, but it's, the, uh, it's all set up as wallpapering. Now, all of this is combustible. And let's take a look at the, does the question answer section work in here? Maybe, yeah, let's, uh, I've got the Q and A in. I'm just looking to see the, on the chat if I have something. I guess the question for the audience is, would this type of finish be allowed in a type one, two building? Non-combustible construction, would we allow this? Anybody wanna be brave and put something in the chat? Um, or, or note something in the questions. So Corey New Kirk, thank you very much for being brave. Sent in the chat question that uh, yes, you think so, and that is correct. All of this material is allowed in a Type One building. Uh, this is faux wood paneling, but you could actually use real wood paneling on the interior finish of a Type One construction building. So there's no limitation on combustible materials for finish materials in a building. Combustible materials are not permitted for the construction, but they are going to be allowed inside, um, inside the building as part of the finished materials. Another item that they talk about is show windows. When we have show windows, wood or unprotected metal is going to be permitted in the show window. So a lot of these storefront facilities that are type one construction, as long as we're putting display windows for mercantile or, or, dis, or anything of that nature, those can be framed out of wood or metal that's not fire rated when we're in a type one, uh, a protected assembly type one or type two A constructions. 
Now, looking at that, I told you we're going to talk about chapter eight and this slide, chapter five, I'm jumping right in and we're going to be talking now about combustible materials in chapter six. You can't really look at chapter eight without having looked at chapter six. Chapter six talks about our construction types. We have five different construction types in the building code. Uh, the 2021 IBC is going to be expanding type four construction, which was a dead construction type almost, and revitalizing it with cross laminated timber. And so what we're gonna see in the 2021 code is a little bit more in the type four construction, but there's four general material types. Types one and two permit absolutely no combustible materials in the construction of the building, in the building materials. Again, as I said on the previous slide, we are allowing them in the finished materials of those buildings. Types two, types three and four construction, the exterior walls are only are required to be of non-combustible material, but the rest of the building is permitted to be of any material construction type uh, or any materials that you want, floors and so forth. Type five construction is the free for all. Any structural material can be used in a type five construction building. So IBC chapter six, section 603, then goes in to say, when can combustible materials be used in a non-combustible building? So again, anywhere inside the one or two type constructions or in the exterior walls of type three or type four construction. So this is what's gonna be allowed. The first item on the list is fire retardant treated lumber. And this is actually a wood product. It is considered combustible, even though it's fire retardant, it's still a combustible material, and it is allowed in non-bearing partition walls as long as they're not required to be fire rated or have a fire rating of less than two hours. In non-bearing exterior walls as well, as long as they're not required to be fire rated, and in roof construction, except in type 1A construction, it's not allowed for the roof. In buildings more than two stories in height, it's not allowed for a roof, and in any roof, that is less than 20 feet above the finished floor surface. So that would include a mezzanine level or portions of the space that may be less than 20 feet. They would not be allowed to have fire retardant treated wood. Now I wanna highlight in here as we look at this, the non-bearing partitions are vertical elements. Bearing walls, non-bearing walls are also vertical elements. So we're allowing the fire retardant treated in non-bearing elements, meaning that we're not putting at risk the strength of the building. Now, there is an exception in type three construction. Type three construction will allow uh, fire retardant treated wood as part of the bearing materials of the building for the exterior wall. Also with CLT, we're gonna see an exception allowing CLT combustible materials to be used in the exterior wall of type four construction. So there are some exceptions allowing this in a bearing wall situation. However, in general, we're looking at something that's not part of the bearing. But what you'll notice here is while the roof can be considered fire retardant treated in certain conditions, if it's high above the floor, we're not gonna see any floor construction. A very common mistake on architectural drawings and by engineers uh, and by building officials or inspectors is they'll say, oh, you can put wood inside a building as long as it's fire retardant treated. That is not the case. That is not correct. Most of the time when wood is inside of a non-combustible building, it is not required to be fire retardant treated. And in several locations where you are not allowed to have wood, it's not going to be permitted even if it is fire retardant treated. So the number one example I'm going to give you of that is floor sheathing. I often see a mezzanine built into a type one building a warehouse or, or some structure of that nature. It's a type 2B construction, type 3B, con, uh, type 2B construction. And as they go into the building, they put down steel joists and a wood sheathing to create a floor diaphragm. Wood sheathing is in a floor, even if it's fire retardant treated, wood sheathing is not permitted inside of a floor framing assembly. And so we will note that even if you fire retardant treat it, it doesn't meet the requirements of the code. If the finished material is wood, as I spoke before, that's not what we're talking about. This would be sheathing on the wall that would need to be fire retardant treated. And then it, as long as it was non-bearing wall, it would comply here or here. 
Any questions as I jump on about when fire return treated material is permitted in a non-combustible building or any of those limitations? I'll give a second in case anyone wants to type something in the chat. Jumping forward on this, here are the locations in which we are going to see combustible materials permitted in addition to that. Uh, the first one, as I said, not covered by chapter eight is millwork. You wanna note that insulation is all permitted in 26, chapter 26, but you'll notice that trim and finishes, we're gonna kick you over to chapter eight and that's what we're talking about today. Furring strips, again, we talk about chapter eight. Now, furring strip is interesting because a furring strip is concealed. This is when I'm going to fur out or bring out from the wall a finished material or also coming down from the ceiling, anything that's suspended from the ceiling. The structural members, the structural floor ceiling assembly is the one we're worried about and then furring can come down. And we'll talk about this a little bit later this in, in the presentation, but be aware that wood furring strips are gonna be allowed even in our non-combustible buildings. That's what this is saying. They do not have to be fire return treated per se if they meet the requirements. We'll talk about that brief in, in a bit. Um, other items in here, stages and platforms can be a wood construction, partitions under five, six feet in height. Another one that gets missed all the time is blocking. Wood blocking can be used any location as without fire return treatment. That can be blocking to support grab bars, blocking to support handrails, blocking to support millwork, things of that nature. Uh, blocking is by nature small to buy material typically. It would not include, I had a, an architect come in or a design come in and they wanted to um, use plywood along the entire interior wall behind the, uh, so they can mount shelving at any location on the wall. That would be not considered blocking. That would be a plywood finish. All right, there's a question from Corey Newkirk, type two verse, 2B versus 5B, fire rated nailing boards at a parapet. 5B is not required, 2B is it still required? And I'm guessing that question, Corey, if you could clarify is whether or not it has to be fire return treated. And is that what you mean by fire rated nailing board at the parapet? A nailing board, a nailer is typically gonna fall into place under blocking and it is not required to be fire return treated ever. It is blocking material only, it's a nailer. It is not, it's not necessary to be fire return treated. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Heavy timber is also permitted, and we'll talk about that again in chapter eight, giving some clarification about heavy timber and its allowance in combustible build buildings. And then you can have some combustible materials inside concealed spaces. Again, there are some limitations. So moving forward, looking at that. Let's take a look at, at foam plastic. So we go into the general provisions of chapter eight. The first thing it talks about is foam plastics. So this is our ethos. Well, ethos is normally on the exterior, but this is any type of foam materials to finish up. And the first rule of thumb is it's not allowed. You can't have any foam materials as an interior finish. Now, there are some exceptions. The first being that it is allowed as an interior finish material. And so I say it's not allowed, and then I say it can be if it complies with 803.4, and it can also be used as trim. So the restrictions, if you want it to be an interior finish. Now, again, finished material means this is what people are going to see inside the building. It's the finished surface. And we go to IBC 2603.9. That's what this reference here is for, is IBC 2603.9. And it says, as long as both exposed and as long as it's both exposed and part of the fin or part of the finished material, it can be there and it must be specifically approved via large scale testing. So the foam has to be part of exposed material. It can't be concealed as part of the construction and it has to be tested in a large scale testing similar to NFPA 286, FM 4880, UL 1040 and UL 1715. Uh, Mike Hoopinger, um, Hoop and Garner, I'll get that maybe right, hopefully, asked what version of the IBC. The, these slides are presented off of the 2018 IBC. 
Uh, I am going to highlight some of the information from the 2021 IBC. Not a lot of significant changes in the 2021 IBC out of this uh, section of the code. So just, just an FYI on that one, but I am referencing the 2018 IBC. Interior trim materials. Now trim materials are limited in their sizing. These are typically going to be around a door, um, top of wall, bottom of wall, maybe a chair rail, something of this nature. It will be our trim. They're permitted again foam as long as it maintains a minimum density of 20 pounds per cubic foot. And it's limited to one half inch maximum in thickness. So you could have some sort of foam uh, build out to allow, to allow a trim or, or some sort of architectural element, but it's going to be limited to 10% of the wall area to be considered trim. So again, half inch maximum thickness, a minimum density, and a limited amount of square area. All right, so we've got what about shaped acrylic thin shell panels that are suspended from ceiling or mounted on frame gypsum walls? Is there a percent limitation? So Acrylic materials, uh, we'll actually talk about those in just a bit, uh, but they are allowed as long as they meet certain test ratings. And so the general rule of thumb, and we'll get to it in just a second, is going to be as long as it meets a flame spread and a smoke development index. And we'll talk about that just, just a little bit. It's going to be allowed in the building. Foam plastics or anything made out of foam generally would have to comply with these items. And so if it is a foam with an acrylic paint or something on it, it would be limited to 20, 10% of the wall or floor area and half inch maximum thickness. If it's actually just an acrylic material, it's not considered a foam or a plastic, it would jump into, and we, we have, we'll talk about those later, they can meet other testing requirements. And again, looking at the, and we'll I have a slide just to, on the very next slide, we'll go into more detail, but the flame smoke index for a foam trim is gonna be limited to 75 and the smoke development index is not restricted. So any smoke development, but again, that's trim because it's limited to 10% of the wall. So what I was saying in general is the interior finishes in a building are always going to be limited or generally limited to a fire performance and a smoke development. So this flame spread index, and I'm not exactly certain how these come in, but, but they're all based off of the test data from ASTM E84 or UL723, which are essentially the same test. And this is a cute little fireplace. What we do with this flame test is they a flame is put on the wall and the flame spread index is how fast flames will burn along that material. The zero being, they don't move at all along the material. Concrete, for example, would have a low flame spread index. Fire doesn't burn along concrete. It doesn't light up. The smoke development index, SDI here, is how much smoke is created. Again, zero being the smallest, 450 being the highest permitted. A class A material has to have a flame spread index of less than 25. The smoke development index is not really limited for any of the class materials. Class B finished materials are between 26 and 75 on the flame spread, and the class C is 76 to 200. Just to get some clarification, just, just to bring some things in, most standard wood products, if you were to just take a piece of wood and set it down on the ground, will meet a class C finish. 76 to 200. So, so a general piece of untreated, unpainted wood will most likely qualify as a class C finish period. Fire retardant treated wood, a lot of painted or stained woods will can get it to and meet a class A finish. So even though I might have a wood finish material, as long as I can meet the classification class A or class B, I can use it wherever those classes are there. Generally, in 803.13, we end up with this table right here, and it's going to say, based on the occupancy group of the space and whether or not the building is sprinklered or non-sprinklered. Now, for this table, either an NFPA 13 system or a 13R system in residential facilities will be considered a fully sprinklered building. So, in a fully sprinklered building, what we're going to see is the largest restriction is going to be an I-3 occupancy. I-3 occupancies in the exit passageway will require an 
class A finish, and they'll require one in corridors and exit access stairways as well. But everywhere else, a B or a C finish is going to be permitted. And so in a sprinkler building, typically in almost every location, standard rooms and enclosures, not corridors or exits, we're going to see a class C finish is almost always permitted, with the exception, again, of the I-4 and the I-2 occupancies in that building. And there are some footnotes that would allow those finishes anyways. If the building is not sprinkler, we're going to see that restriction gets a lot higher. Uh, we're going to now see a class B finish in our A1, A2 occupancies, R4 occupancies, H, I1, I2, I3, and I4 occupancies. But again, like I said, standard wood, untreated, unpainted, almost always classifies as a class C. And you can see for most occupancies, even in a non sprinkler building, there's no limitation and a class C finish will be permitted. Again, just to get an idea of what we're looking at is we're trying to prevent fire from spreading inside the room once the flame is there or from smoke filling in the room. And so a standard room is what we're gonna see in this first column. This is the most common location. As we move over, we're looking at locations that are a little bit more sensitive to smoke and hot gases. Corridors and exit access stairways, these are places that are restricted in area. Uh, but people have to travel through them. We don't want them to fill with smoke. They're going to require a higher classification than a standard room. And then exit passageways and interior exit stairways. These we want to keep very safe and they will be even more restrictive. So there are some restrictions as we move up in our classification. So generally speaking, what the IBC says is as long as my finished material meets the flame uh, the, the flame development, uh, so I'm getting this wrong, sorry. The, the flame spread index, sorry. As long as it meets the flame spread index of the classifications noted here, that material is permitted as a finished material in that space. Whether it's combustible, non-combustible, all that matters is the flame spread index and it can be used in those locations. Again, in a non-sprinkler building, if I'm inside the exit stairway of an A1, A2, A3 assembly area, I may require a class A finish, whereas once I sprinkle that building now, I only need a class B finish in the exit enclosure. So that's how this table is read. Now, with that being said, this would not be the IBC if there weren't a long list of exceptions, and that's where they come into play is there's some exceptions here. The first one is that any material is permitted if it's less than 0.036 inches in depth. So this is paint and wallpaper. Um, your paint coating or whatever it is doesn't have to be the flame spread because as long as you're applying it in this lower level. Now, paint may be used or maybe stains or finishes to get wood to meet or other combustible materials to meet a flame spread index. But generally, as long as the material is significantly thin, it is not required to have a flame spread index. The next one is exposed heavy timber. Now, I told you before that heavy timber was going to be allowed inside the buildings of non-combustible construction. Heavy timber has to be exposed. The way that heavy timber works is we have very large pieces of wood, and in the event of a fire, they char. So the fire doesn't burn through that log very quickly. If you're dealing with, with a fireplace or a a fire pit, you throw in a giant log, it just burns. And for a long time, it chars and it smolders and it takes forever to get through. And that's the idea of heavy timber. But if it's concealed, that fire can take place and spread along the surface of the wood without us knowing about it. And so heavy timber has to be exposed. We have to be able to see it from the inside of the room or finished space in order to be permitted. Now, the exception is that inside of the interior exit stairways or exit passageways, heavy timber would not be permitted in areas that are required to be of non-combustible construction. Unless it has a finished material that meets those requirements. So again, if I were to jump back and, and let me do that real quick. Uh, well, if we jump back, remember exit interior exit stairways in a sprinkler building are probably going to require uh, a B or a C finish, but most of the occupancies require a, B, a class B finish, and the exit passageways would require even a class B finish predominantly or a class A finish in non-sprinkler buildings. And so I said wood 
standard wood is going to be a class C. And so that's why we're going to limit and say, well, not in these locations, you would have to maintain the class finish. Okay, so exposed heavy timber, except in exit stairways, even though it's a class C finish would be permitted in an area. So let's go back. I just want to highlight that in this slideshow. Let's say I have a non-sprinkler building. I'm inside of a corridor of an A2 occupancy. It's going to say I need a class A finish. The exception here is going to say that I can have exposed heavy timber, even though it has a class C finish, the exposed heavy timber would be then permitted in that corridor, even though it's a class C finish. So that's what I'm saying. The general provision is the classification, finish classification in 803.13. These exceptions are going to come in and give you different requirements. Textile wall coverings. This was really popular in the 70s and some of the 80s as well. We put carpet on a wall. I think there's still locations where it's done, just not as, as frequently it was then. If I use any sort of textile wall covering, it has to be tested in accordance with the manner in which it's used. So I can't use a test in which the carpet is on the ground. I have to use a test where the carpet's been applied to a wall. The test has to be done in a vertical position. And it must be done per NFPA 265, or if the building is provided with a full NFPA 13 sprinkler system, as long as it has a class A finish, it's permitted in any occupancy. Textile coverings, so ceilings. So now we're looking at some sort of cloth or fabric being put on top of a, a, on a ceiling. They're going to again test per NFPA 265, or they can test per NFPA 286 to meet the finish requirements. Vinyl wall coverings, I think we talked about acrylics a little earlier. This is very similar. Vinyl wall coverings can pass the 265 test, a 286 test, or as long as they're class A and the building is provided with sprinklers, they're permitted in any, any occupancy in any location. So again, we can provide test data showing that the, the material that we have is passing one of these two tests. The vinyl ceiling coverings, these ones, if I have vinyl ceilings, they have to pass 280, NFPA 286 or be class A with an NFPA 13 sprinkler. So the 265 test is not permitted on the ceiling. All right, so the question is if the carpet owner, if the building owner wants a four inch carpet base, will the base carpet require test data? Okay, so that's the next excellent question. Um, going back to the previous slide, yes, you could provide base if, you, if you're gonna take the carpet up the wall four inches, you could, but we're gonna talk about a, a little bit there. You could also use a base exception or the trim exception. So both of those, any one of those three exceptions will apply. So if I have carpet on the wall, but it's limited to four inches, we can less than 10% of the floor area, I can consider a trim and I can meet the trim exception. Or, and we'll get to that in a minute, or there's an exception for base, bases, floor bases, and you can meet the floor base material. So any one of those exceptions can be used and applied for that base carpet. So yes, we require test data, but we'll look at what, some of those other exceptions as we move forward. Polypropylene or high density polyethylene, HDPE. If you have any of these types of materials, they have to pass specific test data and testing requirements. So again, it's not just the class finish now. If I have these materials, they must also meet those requirements. Site fabricated stretch systems, uh, stretch cloth systems, anything that's being set up in that way, they have to pass a specific type of test. Laminate it with wood substrate. So if I have a laminate material and it's on a wood base, whether that's particle board, MDF, or whatever it might be, or, or hardwood, a laminate material it has to meet this requirement. Uh, uh, it has specific testing requirements. Generally, what it is, it can be either a class A, B, or C finish, as long as it's been installed per AS, and I'm missing a letter here, I apologize, ASTME2579. Wood veneer, if I have a wood finish over a wood substrate, again, it's going to be allowed to be the class A, B, or C finish as we talked, as would normally be permitted, as long as it's installed per ASTM E2404. 
So again, we would go back to 803.13, that table we started with a general rule and meet the class A, B, or C finish depending on the room in which we're located. But for wood finishes, wood veneers, or wood substrate uh, laminated elements, we would just need to meet the re insulation requirements of these two sections. All right, any questions on the exceptions before I jump into the next section of chapter eight? So give you guys a second to, to type up if you had any questions there. Again, in summary, and I'll jump back to these slides as, as we look at these. In summary, this is the starting place is 803.13. Um, and we're going to determine what class finish we need to have. The classification is going to be based on these tests, um, ASTM E84 or UL723, to give us a class A or class B or class C finish. And so we'll look at the material information from the manufacturer. They'll specify and get a specification as to what their finish is for those testings, A, B, or C, and it meets these requirements. If going through again, we have multiple exceptions in 803.2 through 803.13, if one of those materials is used, such as heavy timber, uh, vinyl, wood, finishes, those ones would need to meet the additional testing requirements of those sections, or they may not require testing depending on what those exceptions state in those sections of the code. So uh, Tina, excellent question. How does this section address the more creative wall finishes now desired, for example, faux green walls, et cetera? Options that may not have been tested, are these considered art? Um, no, if they're finished material, they, they can't be. Uh, art would have to be mounted to a finished surface. And so um, if I guess if you were to put it in a picture frame and set some of it up there, you might be able to buy, buy it off as, as some sort of art artwork. Um, I did have a building, two buildings in the last few little bit. And I, I apologize, I should have put a picture and I meant to add this that in there of grass a fake grass being put on the wall and ceiling in a building to make it look, uh, I, I don't know, make it more green. Like you say, they might be unique. Uh, they would need to have a testing material. Now, the grass, and I call it grass, I don't know what else to, to call it, um, artificial turf, it did have a test data. It was used in the exterior exit stairway enclosure, so it met the uh, class A finish. It had a test data to show it was a class A finish but you would need to provide some sort of test data if it was a finish. Now, there are some exceptions. We'll talk about them when we get to that section on trim. If they take up less than 10% of the wall, they can be used as trim, and that may get you out of test, testing requirements. But in general, whether it's combustible or non-combustible, if they do have a creative finish, you would need to find a material that has a, a test data for it, at least, again, with the flame spread and smoke development index. But excellent question. Okay, jumping forward, let's take a look. Uh, we were at wall and ceiling finishes. We finished these exceptions and looked at fire rated or non-combustible construction. This is probably the most important slide, one single slide in my presentation today. So hopefully at least you'll stay awake long enough to listen to this slide. Fire rated or non-combustible construction. So if I'm in non-combustible buildings or if I am in a fire rated building. So the number one problem I run into is multifamily construction. Multifamily construction requires fire rated corridors and fire rated partitions between dwelling units. That's a fire rated construction. Otherwise, a type 5A, 5, um, 3A, 2, 4, 2A construction where I have rated a fire construction uh, for my construction types. If I directly attach, what can I attach to a fire rated wall assembly or a floor ceiling assembly? And so I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to sketch up in my little pen here. 
when I have, and this is going to be my little wall assembly. Oh, I apologize. Sometimes my mouse decides to go crazy on me. So please ignore that weird little, the weird little ones there. Uh, see if I can maybe draw this up without all the weirdness. Um, where's my eraser? So drawing this up again, um, as we look at it, this might be your wood stud inside the wall, and I'm going to have gypsum on either sides of this wall. And if I was teaching a class on fire rated construction, what you what you would find out is that the wall assembly from the UL, we're going to call it a UL listing or whatever it might be, you might be going to 721. The wall assembly is going to essentially tell you that everything from this portion from the gypsum and all the way to the other side to the gypsum or whatever it might be, what's listed in that assembly, that is your fire rated wall assembly. Nothing inside that wall can change without permission. That's got to meet the testing. It's got to be done exact in order to have a fire rated construction. Okay, in non-combustible construction, we're going to be in a similar situation. From the outside edge of the wall to the outside edge of that wall, everything in that space has to be non-combustible. So I'm not going to be allowed wood sheathing. I'm not going to be, unless it's fire retardant treated and it's a non-bearing wall. The studs can't be, again, can't be wood unless it meets one of those exceptions. Everything inside this gap is going to be non-combustible or everything in this gap is finished. And now the question comes down to, well, what happens when I want to maybe fur this out and, and you can fur it out just a little bit. Maybe I'm going to put some blocking out here and then I want to put some sort of vinyl finish or, um, and this is now my finish. And I'm just going to put fin because I don't want to spend all day typing, uh, drawing with my mouse. Or we might decide that, hey, we're going to have a, and let me erase this so it shows up better. And I'm going to switch colors so to clarify this maybe. What what if I want to have a plumbing wall, for example? I put a plumbing wall next to that fire partition, and because I'm a genius, I'm going to come in and decide that hey, I don't want to put my plumbing fixtures inside my fire rated wall, so I'm going to come out here. I'm going to build a stud wall out here, and I'm going to have gypsum out here as well. And this will be my finished exterior wall, and I might have some plumbing pipes. I might have some duct works inside this wall. And I'm going to fur out the wall and, and create this space. Again, as I'm looking at this wall, this is my fire rated or non combustible wall from here to here. And, and I apologize, I'm going to, I, I don't like this, but I drew this with the same color. So maybe I'll highlight this to clarify. Um, hopefully this doesn't delete it. This, this highlighted yellow spot, that is my wall. That's my wall. Anything inside here is my fire rated UL assembly or it's my non-combustible construction. Nothing combustible, nothing that's not part of the listed assembly can be in that section, depending on which one I'm at. But now the question and caveat comes into, well, what about the finished material? What can I attach to it? Well, the first thing is that I can directly attach any exterior finished material I want to the wall. So I can attach um, wood paneling right to the outside of my fire rated wall assembly, and that's fine. I can attach wood paneling right to the outside edge of my non-combustible um, construction. And so again, I'm gonna have my gypsum right up against my steel stud, and then I'm gonna throw in and directly attach um, wood paneling. I can actually fur out with strips up to one and three quarter inches thick. So this little stud right here, flat stud, is allowed to be a one by material. It can come out one and three quarter inches and I can pull my finish out one and three quarter inches. This furring strip can be combustible. This can be a wood furring strip even in types one or two construction. Um, if I use a furring strip, I have to either meet one of these requirements, and I apologize, now, now it's coming in underneath my picture. Uh, it has to be fire blocked, so that means I'm going to go put blocking in between these spaces. It's actually going to require fire blocking eight feet.
feet on center in each direction. That's not on the slide, but you'll find it in 80315. So I put every eight feet on center, I have to have blocking. Eight feet vertically, I have to have blocking. Or I can solid fill this gap between the furring strips with non combustible material. Or as long as the furring strip, the gypsum here, and this wall mat finished material all have a class A finish, then it doesn't matter what I put in this space. So again, wood studs, wood paneling in a non combustible building can be furred out up to a one and three quarter inches as long as it meets one of these three requirements class A, solid fill with non combustible materials, or fire block eight feet on center in each direction. Uh, the, another exception is if the furring material is non-combustible, so instead of using wood, if I used a steel stud, then I don't have to do anything. I can have my wood paneling and that's fine. There's no issues whatsoever. Now, set out construction. And now I showed this for a while, but please be aware this is, would also qualify for a ceiling assembly. You can fur out a ceiling assembly as well. Again, maximum one and three quarter inches. If I have set out construction, set out construction meaning what I've done on this side of the wall over here, I'm coming away from the finish of my non combustible or my fire rated wall. I'm furring it out a little bit more than one and three quarter inches. Instead of calling it a furred out wall like we did over here, the IBC is now going to call it set out construction. And this qualifies for ceilings as drop ceilings or recess ceilings, anything that we might be looking at in that nature. The code now says, hey, because it's set out, now you have to have a class A finish. So this material out here has to be a class A material. Or the exception is you can put a sprinkler to the concealed space. So I can put uh, sprinklers on this side of the wall and on this side of the wall. So this, I can put a sprinkler head inside this space. And now I don't have to have a class A finish. Or I can have a non combustible backing. And so what that means is that. This material right here, um, if this was wood finish, maybe it has a class B finish, it's not class A, as long as it was glued to or directly attached to gypsum board or something that had a class uh, that was non combustible, I could have it, I, that would be permitted. So as long as the portion facing the enclosed space is non combustible, I'm okay. And the third option is instead of sprinkling this gap, gap in here, I can solid fill it with non-combustible materials. So mineral wool or something of that nature. Now, when I go into a drop ceiling situation, if I'm in a drop ceiling, uh, this is now, as I said before, there's a lot of exceptions with fire turn treated wood for vertical assemblies because fire burns up, it doesn't burn sideways. But when I'm in a ceiling assembly, that fire is coming up, the flames are gonna come right up against it, or it's gonna burn into a floor assembly, which could collapse. Now the drop ceiling has to be of non-combustible construction. And so the framing members supporting the drop ceiling have to be uh, metal or in types three and type five construction, they have to be fire retardant treated wood. So I've highlighted this in purple. This is one of the key elements. Uh, number one problem I see in multifamily construction, the floor ceiling assembly in, in my 5A construction or 5B multifamily, the floor ceiling assembly has to be fire rated. That means the drop ceiling below the fire rated assembly that my mechanical ducts, my sprinkler heads or whatever it might be are located in. Even though the buildings of type five construction, because I'm furring out or setting out construction from a fire rated assembly, it has to be of non-combustible materials. So again, watch out for fire rated wall assemblies if you're furring out these spaces. Again, remember in type one, two construction, wood is gonna be permitted for these furring strips in both set out construction as well as um, furred out construction. But in the ceiling, if you're going to have set out construction, it does have to be non-combustible. All right, I'm gonna pause again for a second here. If there are any questions, on furring out or set out construction in combustible or non or fire rated construction.
Okay, jumping forward, we talked about heavy timber a little bit earlier before, but in heavy timber construction, we might have wood decks and wood planks. And also this is particularly talking about, and I said heavy timber always has to be exposed, but if I have wood decks and planks, the code will allow me to conceal them and I can apply a finished material. So you, instead of looking up and seeing the wood planks for the floor above and, and my heavy timber construction, I'm allowed to put a finished material to conceal them as long as that's directly applied to the wood decks and paneling. So the heavy timber, I can put gypsum and I can install it directly to the face of, and, and then paint it, I can put paneling, whatever it might be, but it has to be directly attached to the wood deck and planks. It can be applied using a furring strip. Again, the furring strips, I would assume, are going to be limited to one and three quarter inches like we saw before. The code doesn't specifically state that, but it does clarify that if I apply it, it has to be fire blocked. So if I fur it, it has to be fire blocked. It does not allow for set out construction as we saw from not from fire rated assemblies. So in heavy timber construction, normally all the wood has to be exposed, but the code will allow finished materials applied directly to the heavy timber decks and planks, as well as furred out as long as it's fire blocked. Attachments, materials are allowed to be, when we're attaching to it, the material is allowed to be up to one quarter inch thick. So if I'm gonna put gypsum on there, I'm, I'm, it's not really gonna work because half inch gyp won't be there, but I could use one, in, one quarter inch paneling material. And again, I can attach it directly to a wall, a ceiling, or the structure of the of the type for construction. The exceptions, if it's non-combustible material, I can make it as thick as I want, or if it's a class A finished material and it has non-combustible furring strips. So if I'm going to come off of that heavy timber more than uh, off the heavy timber, I can use a class A finish and use non-combustible furring. And then finally, if it's tested a class A material, as it is going to be installed. And so again, it has to be tested now, not in general. It has, if I, this would be an issue where if you have that carpet base, for example, it has to be tested as a wall assembly, not tested as a floor assembly if you were to use that material, again, in heavy timber construction. All right, we're halfway through the presentation. I'm not halfway through the slides. So we'll see if we'll get through everything, but we're jumping on to interior floor finishes. So we've talked about walls, ceilings, we've talked about exceptions, we've talked about furring out assemblies. Now we're gonna look at floors. Floors have two classifications. So walls and ceilings, we said class A, class B, or class C. Those were the three classifications for wall assemblies and ceiling assemblies. Floors, our finished floors have two classifications. It's one or two class assembly. And this is determined using one of these two tests, either ASTM E648 or NFPA 253. I'm gonna clarify this. Essentially, these tests are for carpets only. Other types of materials do not have to be tested, but if we're doing a carpet, the carpet has to be tested and it has to be identified. So the classification one or two needs to be on either the carpet itself or on the material that it's coming and packaging in as it's being delivered to the site. The test that goes on is this, again, ASTM E68, it must pass this DOC FF1, which is commonly referred to as the pill test or a critical radiant flux test. Stairways, exit passageways, and corridors have to pass this critical, critical radiant flux. Again, this is for carpets. And what the code says is in I1s, I2s, and I3, in stairways, exit passageways, and corridors, it must always be a class one finish. In all other OCK, in A, B, E, H, I, M, R, R, 2, and S, it has to be a class two finish. There are no restrictions in the other occupancy types. If fire sprinklers are provided in the building, if the building is provided with fire sprinklers, anywhere up here where I said it had to be a class one, it can now be a class two or I can do a pill test instead of the classification requirements, uh, class one or class two requirements in these occupancies where it was a class two finish. So again, I have a standard pill test or in stairways, exit passageways and corridors, I have to do the class one or class two finish. 
So most carpets are going to be able to pass some of these tests, but again, these would be what we would be looking for, and they have to be listed in those materials. Typically, again, only stairways, exit passageways, and corridors where we're worried about accumulation of smoke and hot gases. Are we going to have restrictions in the classification? And again, if the building's fire sprinklered, it reduces to a class two. And so only a pill test is going to be required. The general pill test for A, B, E, H, I, M, R, et cetera. So most of the time in a sprinkler building, all we have to do is pass a pill test. Now, like I said, while the code says this is for flooring, it really only applies to carpet as the code comes in and says that wood, vinyl, linoleum, terrazzo, and any other resilient floor covering is exempt from any sort of testing. The commentary comes in and says smooth surface floor coverings generally contribute minimally to a fire. The focus is more upon textile floor coverings such as carpets. So again, as I'm looking at the test, at them only if I have some sort of fuzzy carpet in my building do I need to provide any sort of test data for my floor finishes. That being said, what do I do about wood floors or combustible floors inside of a type one, type two building? And this is where I'm gonna stop looking at the floor finish. We talked about the finished material. So I already said right here that wood finish is permitted and no testing is required. So I can have wood, a wood floor in a type one building, no problem. But if it's not directly attached to the floor, now I create what's called a subfloor. And that's what we're gonna see here where they're laying down this furring material underneath the floor. And so this is gonna be my sleepers or sometimes called bucks. I might have nailing blocks along here. And that's what we're gonna see is there right here, we've got these nailing blocks. The requirement is that floor sleepers, bucks, nailing blocks shall all be non-combustible. Well, that's not what's going on here. All of these sleepers are, are wood. So the code says, if I fill the space with non-combustible material. So if I drop in wood sleepers, I can fill the space in between with a non-combustible material, or I can fire block them per IBC 718. And that's what we're seeing here. This would be what the fire blocking looks like every eight feet on center, we're gonna have a block. Now, as I talked about subfloor construction, these materials, the sleepers and bucks, they are allowed to be non-combustible material. You cannot have a wood, this is being set on top of concrete, you cannot have plywood down here in a non-combustible building because that's part of the subfloor. The subfloor is not, is part of the construction material and it has to be fire, of the same construction type. So non-combustible construction, fire retardant treated wood is not permitted for floor assemblies. So again, the finished material and a little bit of the subfloor sleepers, bucks or nailing blocks are allowed. But similarly to the wall condition, wood blocking is allowed, but you can't put wood sheathing in the wall and, and call it blocking. So again, wood subfloors are not permitted in type one and type three construction. Finished floors for wood may be attached directly to a fire rated floor assembly. So even if I have a rated floor ceiling assembly, I can still put a wood floor on top of it. It can have a wood subfloor as long as it complies to, or like I said, fire blocked, as we noted before, or solid filled with non-combustible materials, or to embedded or fire blocked wood sleepers. And so as long as they, the sleepers are embedded in the floor or otherwise blocked, we're allowed to have it when it's part of a fire rated assembly. All right, any questions on floor assemblies? So we talked about, first of all, wall and ceiling finishes. Then we talked about floor finishes. Uh, any questions before we jump into decorations and trim? Now, we had someone ask already about interesting um, finishes like faux grass or faux green walls assemblies. Can they be considered decorations and trim? They might be. Uh, you might be able to consider them decorations. And this is what the code is going to say about decorations or trim. Decorations can be of any material as long as they are not highly flammable. 
they may not obstruct or obscure exits. So be careful about curtains or draperies that might be put in front of doors or exit doors. They cannot block or obstruct them. Vegetation and non-combustible decorations are unlimited in use. So as long as it's live vegetation, not fake vegetation, or it's non-combustible, you can have any sort of wall and floor decorations that, that you may want. If the decoration is combustible, in A, B, E, I, M, R1, and R2 dormitories, so again, only dormitories of R2 occupancies, if I'm in one of these construction types, suspended curtains and draperies are now going to be limited to 10% of the floor area. And so there's the question, window coverings, shades, and draperies, et cetera. Yes, exactly. That's what we'd be looking at. Window coverings, uh, shades, draperies, they would all classify under decorations and trim. So if we have a non-combustible um, metal or, or other trim, it's there. If it's combustible, suspended curtains and drapes will be limited to 10% in these occupancies. Movable walls, paneling, cubicles, and interior are considered interior, such as cubicles would be considered interior finishes. They are not trim materials, they're not decorations. So anything that is paneling on the wall. And so again, this would be that question that was asked before about faux grass or, or faux greenery. If it's set up a, similar to a paneling or that's located on a movable wall, it wouldn't really be considered a decoration. It's going to be considered part of the interior finish. And that's the other question a lot of people come back with me and say, hey, what if I have a giant wall? What if my entire wall in my A occupancy, assembly occupancy is glass? I have this giant glass exterior wall and I want to put a curtain across the whole thing. Well, this says that that combustible curtain is limited to 10%. Again, we could come in and say, well, if we call it a movable wall, then I just need to meet the interior finished material. And so as long as your drapes or curtains meet the interior finished material, class A, class B, whatever it might be in that, that area, you could adjust them as in that situation and say it's a wall finish instead of a decoration or trim. Otherwise, the combustible decoration is limited to 10%, but there is no testing requirement for this. There's no flame spread limitation. There's no classification, there's no additional testing for these combustible decorations. Some items that are limited, regardless of the size, if you have imitation leather and it's coated with pyro, pyroxylin, it will be limited to uh, any occupancy other than group A. Imitation leather is not allowed in group A occupancies. If it's considered an interior trim material, 80607, it's limited to 10% of the floor area or ceiling area, and it only has to be a class C finish. So again, I might be inside my exit stair enclosure. I need to have a, um, I need, inside my exit stair enclosure, I need to have a class A finish. I can put wood trim inside that space, and it only has to maintain a class C as long as it's less than 10% of the wall or ceiling area. I did not note this. It is in the code section. Just be aware that handrails, guardrails, and handrails and guardrails are not considered trim. Okay. They have a separate exception in Chapter 10 of the IBC that specifically states they're allowed to be of wood or other combustible materials. And so you're going to go to Chapter 10. They don't count against your trim. And so I could have a wood handrail and still have 10% of my wall be wood trim, not including the area of the handrail in an area that would normally require a class A finish. So again, the interior trim now only has to meet a class C finish, 10% of the wall air ceiling area. Anything you want essentially can be called trim or it could be considered a decoration, same requirement. Floor and wall base, again, we'd ask, what if the carpet comes up four inches? You can test it as a textile wall finish material, or you could come in and say, well, it's less than 10% of the wall area. It has a class C finish. It's been tested as a wall finish. It counts as trim, or we can call it a floor wall base material. And in then case, it must be capped at six inches in height. So again, the question from this morning, from the beginning of the class was, what if I have four inch of carpet base coming up floor base? 
that's less than six in inches, it must be a class two finish or a class one where the class one floor was required. So essentially what it's going to say is that once I go from the floor up to the wall, it has to now be a class two finish instead of just do a fill test or if the floor was class one in a non-sprinkler building, that was my I1s, I2s and I3s, the wall base must also be a class one finish. If the exterior wall is not required to be rated, do you still need to comply with 10% for drapes? That was a question from Frank Moore. Yes, this has nothing to do with the fire rating of this. This is, this is going to be for all construction types, 5A, 5B. This is not limited to just type 1 and B. Uh, one, this is not the limitations for, for construction. So combustible decorations are still going to be limited in non-combustible buildings or non-rated buildings. Okay, before I jump into the last section of today's presentation and go into acoustical ceiling tiles uh, as we approach the last half of the class, are there any questions on floor finishes? Any additional questions? All right, I believe, and we'll talk about uh, some more of this, but I believe this picture is taken from, um, I believe this was taken from the Wells, Nevada earthquake. Uh, it was back in, I believe, 2006, I want to say. And this was just one of the buildings where, where again, you can just see that while the building didn't maintain any severe damage, the acoustical panels were completely destroyed and, and collapsed in the earthquake. And this can be problematic to using the building. It can cause damage to additional materials. The collapse of the ceiling could, could break electrical wires or gas lines or other things. And so this becomes problematic. So there are some additional code requirements when it comes to suspended acoustical ceiling systems. Um, first of all, we go back to that this is a ceiling system. And so as we talked about finished requirements, the ceiling itself must comply with section 803. So, that might be the classification A, B, C. Again, like I said, generic, if it's a wood finished material, I might have to meet one of those other exceptions, but it's gonna be either a class A, class B, class C finish generally. The next thing the code says is we install it for ASTM C635 and C636. This, this has been modified in the 2015 code to consolidate it. And again, in the 2018 code, it just references these two standards. If it is part of a fire rated assembly, it shall be installed in the same manner as assembly testing. And so if it's a listed rated assembly and the suspended ceiling is part of that, you have to meet all the requirements of the list fire rated listing assembly. These may be in addition to C635 and C636. Okay, just some clarification. So IBC 808 is the section of the code that talks about acoustical ceiling systems. 808.1 is the one that references us back, as we said, the finished material. Uh, finished classifications are the same. 808.11 is the one that tells us to go to C635 and C636. And 808.112 is where fire resistance rating is required. If it is required, it's going to comply with IBC Chapter 7. So let's talk about C ASTM C635 and C636. So C635 is not really gonna be applicable to most of the people in today's presentation, unless there are any ceiling manufacturers out there. This talks about materials allowed in the actual properties of the T-channels or the grid system itself. So it's material properties and how those materials are built, sizing, spacing, et cetera. It's a very small document. I think it's five to 10 pages tops. Doesn't say much at all other than you need to meet these test criteria for how it's built. So most generic materials you buy off the shelf are going to comply with C635. However, if you're importing something from Germany or China, you're going to need to make sure that those materials have compliance with C635 or the manufacturers to provide that information of equivalent testing. C636 
is going to be more along the lines of what we need as a designer. It provides minimum detailing requirements for the installation of ceiling tiles. Its use is for installers, designers, plan reviewers, and inspectors. Here's the information that you're gonna find in ASTM C636 if you were to get this standard. Uh, what I wanna highlight is the code doesn't necessarily say you have to put all this information on your plans for C636. I will talk about when it does have to be on the plans, but you could reference installation of this similar to gypsum where you say, hey, please install gypsum in accordance with, and I'm now I'm drawing a blank as to what the standard is that's referenced in chapter 24, uh, but you would come in and uh, not chapter 24, chapter 25, but this is very similar. You would install it in a similar manner. You could say install for C636. Now, when we get to seismic zones, there are some additional requirements that need to be on the construction drawings. So what C636 is gonna say is that hangers, now hangers is how we suspend the system. The hanger has to be attached to a joist or directly to the structure. So a structural deck or metal decking or to a steel joist or a wood joist. We have to provide them every four feet on center and the suspension wire must remain within plumb, one out of six in plumb. So if it suspends six feet, it can be one foot out of plumb. And so that's what we're gonna see here. Here's my ceiling system. Every grid point right here, I have a four feet maximum spacing. I have this little X, that is the location of my well, vertical wire. So I'm gonna have a vertical wire every four feet on center and within two feet of the wall assembly. And that'll go in both directions. This is my vertical wire. Again, one sixth of plumb must be a minimum of a number 12 gauge wire. The carrying channel, so the channel down here supporting the suspended ceilings must be within one eighth of an inch and 12 feet of level. So it can slope no more than one eighth of an inch over 12 feet. These wires suspending it now, these wires are at an angle. I told you the, the vertical wire has to be vertical within one sixth of plumb. Uh, there is an option that does say if you use splay, as long as you provide two approximately equal splay anchors, you can do this in lieu of a vertical anchor, uh, uh, sorry, suspension cable. So I can do two splay wires or I can do a vertical wire. Um, this wire has to be taut, no kinks. I don't want it to be able to come loose. The main runners, and so the main runner is the one that's continuous. The cross runners are supported on the main runner. The main runner has to be level even more so than the standard runner. It has to be a quarter inch instead of within 12 feet, it has to be a quarter inch within 10 feet. And wrap wire three times within three inches. And so as we come in and we're supporting this, we have to have three wraps within three inches. Um, so again, we can have it like this, or we can have it here, a tight, tight wire configuration. The cross runners, again, as we're looking at this diagram right here, this is the main runner. It is continuous all the way from one end to another. This is the cross runner. It goes from main runner to main runner, from main runner to main runner, and is supported on the main runner. The cross runners are supported by the main runner or they can be supported by another cross runner. Uh, the intersection, intersecting runners shall form a right angle. So we're always gonna be at right angles and any exposed surfaces of runners will be within 0.15 inches of vertical. So as we're looking at these members, this cross runner and this main runner have to be within 0.15 inches of each other up and down. So we can't be, further out than that. Cross members shall be located above the continuous member. We can't support them from underneath with some sort of fastener. Ceiling fixtures. So things like this light fixture, uh, fire sprinklers, outlets. Uh, um, what's another one? We might have speakers, HVAC uh, diffusers, anything of that nature. Uh, fixtures cannot compromise the ceiling performance. So anything in there, uh, I can't have a any sort of fixture here, which might prevent the ceiling from functioning. So if I put a really large hole in here or it spans from here to here and there's no support, that would cause the ceiling to fail in some performance. The fixtures cannot be supported by the ceiling. They must be self-supported. 
And the exception is if I have a supplemental hanger within six inches. So this one right here in the middle of the panel, it has to have its own wire somehow supporting it. But say a light fixture, if I bring it out and I support it on the main runners here and here, as long as the main runners have a support wire within six inches of the fixture, the code would allow this, the, the standard would allow that construction. So that's generic installation of the tiles. Like I said, the code doesn't require that these plans be there. You can simply reference that and say it's installed for ASTM C636. Now the problem is in seismic design, we have additional requirements. And so again, stepping out of chapter eight, but it's concurrent with it, is IBC 1613.1. And this section of the code says that any non-structural components in the building that are permanently attached to the structure, which these would be, I could, again, because C636 told us I have to have a wire directly attached to the structure. So that's what this says, permanently attached to the structure right here. The earthquake must, it must be earthquake design per chapter 13 of ASC 716. Um, so this is the same reference in the 2021 IBC as well. Nothing new here, it's been this way for a while. 716 made some modifications in the 2018 code as to what those seismic bracing requirements were. And it simply states that seismic bracing is not required for the following ceilings. Uh, first of all, any ceiling less than seismic design category C. So if you're in seismic design category B or below, you do not uh, have to have seismic bracing. And then the second one is ceilings that are less than 144 square feet in area. So 12 by 12. And they are surrounded on all four sides by walls that are braced to the structure above. So this is what it means. I have a suspended ceiling and there's a wall right here. And this wall is braced up either with wire or with, uh, we could use a structural member here. We have a rigid brace on one direction and this is braced up to the structure. As long as the wall is braced, and the ceiling comes up to the wall, and the area is less than 144 square feet, then this ceiling does not have to be braced. If the wall is not braced to the ceiling, or if the ceiling doesn't touch the wall, it's a cloud or something of that nature, then it still has to be seismically braced, even if it is less than 144 square feet. If I'm using screw or nail attached gypsum board, the code goes on to say that it always must be surrounded by braced walls, walls that are braced to the structure. So I'm not allowed to have nail, screw or nail attached gypsum board unless it has walls on all sides to support it. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. It has to be, yeah, it has, there's no limit in size for screw and nail for it, but just must be attached and braced. So, if I'm using gypsum board, as long as it's attached to the walls that are braced, then I don't need any seismic bracing for the gypsum board ceiling. I apologize. Let me rephrase that, get it, say that correctly. So just to get an idea, and I apologize, the map's from Utah, not, not Nevada. I didn't have a chance to, to change that up for you guys. I missed that. This is out of the IRC, because the IRC shows me instead of the speeds and uh, accelerations, it actually gives you um, what the seismic design category is, but you can see that for Utah, um, this is the E area right here in the middle. We go to D2, D1, D0, and then they specify it out here, this 0.33, just to get clarification. Here's my seismic design category C in Utah, and we're touching on Nevada right here as well, so you can kind of see that. We've got this little blanket right here and here in Nevada and this little portion up in the north that's going to be seismic design category C. But in general, most of Nevada is going to be falling into the category seismic design category D and above. And so that's going to trigger the seismic provision. So most of the work that's being done in the state of Nevada will require seismic bracing. And what ASC 7 says is that it has to be seismically designed and comply with ASTM C635, C636. This is the same as what was required in the IBC 808. But now for seismic design category C, 
it must also meet the detailing requirements of ASTM E580. Now, I want to clarify that E580 provides minimum detailing requirements. It does not provide engineering design for the bracing of seismic seal, uh, of ceilings. So ASC 7, IBC 1613.1 requires technically that all suspended ceilings be designed and engineered. And, there, and the exception is in seismic design category B, or as I said below, above areas that are less than 144 square feet. In addition to the engineering requirement, they must also meet the minimum detailing requirements of E580. So again, re-emphasizing that E580 is for areas subject to ground motion. So this is the standard ASTM E580. It has provisions for seismic design category C in chapter four. And then in chapter five, it has additional provisions for seismic design categories D, E, and F. We'll talk about it in more detail, but please be aware that the requirements in seismic design category C are substantially different from seismic design category D, E, and F. So I do a lot of work in Northern Nevada. And, and when I'm in Sparks and uh, Carson City and the area over in that location, the majority of my projects are seismic design category D. Down in Southern Nevada, as I'm playing around in Las Vegas, I'll have several projects that are in seismic design category D, but I'll have several that fall in seismic design category C. And the minimum detailing requirements are completely different between these two codes. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. So please be aware that this is not just a typical detail. Uh, you'll need to coordinate with a structural engineer and determine if you're in seismic design category C or if you're in seismic design category D so that the proper detailing can be provided because we use two different methodologies to, to brace these, these units. Now, you can always go in and use the more restrictive. So you could use the seismic design category D provisions everywhere, uh, and that would be safe, but there's additional requirements if you decide to do that. Again, remember what I said, these are minimum detailing requirements. So they are for building officials, inspectors, and plans examiners, but this is not in lieu of seismic engineering. You still, if you're in seismic design category C and above, have to engine, they should be, technically the code requires them to be engineered. And then ASCE 7 is going to require that the engineer and contractor install them for the minimum detailing requirements. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to seismic design category D. So looking at the requirements from ASTM E580 again, in seismic design category C, the individual components, this is the T channels or whatever we might have suspending them, must be designed to support at least a 2.5 pounds per square foot loading. And the main and cross runners have to be capable of supporting a minimum of 60 pounds in tension and compression. So the idea is we're assuming that the maximum loading going in the seismic design category C along the cross runner or along the main runner is going to be 60 pounds. It'll never get higher than 60 pounds before it gets to some sort of structure that supports it. The suspension system is gonna be very similar. It says that we're gonna now have a perimeter angle and this little perimeter angle is, is what's attached to the wall at the edge. And it has to be a seven eighths of an inch angle. It has to be seven eighths of an inch in length. And that a support for the wall now has to be within eight inches. So standard ASTM C636 said the first support was within two feet of the wall. Now the code is saying that the runner has to be a seismic design category C. It has to be within six, within eight inches of the edge of the runner. And a three eighths inch of a gap is between the runner and the wall. So I have a gap between the wall, three eighths of an inch gap between the wall. So this allows this, and this will not be attached. We'll talk about that in a bit. This allows this gap, allows this channel to move three eighths of an inch in either direction without falling off the channel. In addition, we must prevent spreading at the terminal ends. And so that's what this spreader bar does. So this is my cross grid, my T cross grid comes in to the outside perimeter angle. 
And then this little V clip coming over the top of it prevents at the edge from these two parallel lines from spreading apart and allowing the panel to fall out at the edge. And so this keeps them per parallel with each other and holds the panels in place. We will not have pop rivets at the end. So we will not connect the cross runner to the angle. And the intent here in seismic design category C, we're assuming that there's less motion. And so the walls and the ceiling are gonna act separately and we're gonna allow the walls to move back and forth. They're not gonna weigh very much and they'll just kind of float. The idea is that it floats up there in the air, bounces back and forth and will stay and won't fall down. And if we attach to the walls, then we could be creating some additional seismic forces we could be throwing into the wall, but in, into the ceiling. And so what we do is we don't want it attached. We want the ceiling to be able to just float. And it's gonna dissipate its energy by wiggling back and forth and just floating up there in the seismic design category C. Any one of our escutcheons or breaks inside this will have an impenetration of a three eighths of an inch gap. Again, remember that was the same gap that we required between the runner and the edge angle was to allow this panel to just move three eighths of an inch in any direction. The suspension wire supporting it from the ceiling is to attach to a joist or structure above, and it must be designed for 200 pounds of ultimate load or 100 pounds of load with safety factor of two. So these are the two situations. This is an older standard. Back in the day, steel structures and concrete used an ultimate load factor of 200 and wood used an allowable loading. And so this was just telling you what the safety factor was to use for wood. It had to be 100 pounds with a, with a safety factor of two. Not really coherent with the design case. So 200 pound ultimate load is what we're looking at. Then it goes on to specify that what that means is it's three loops within three inches for a at four feet on center of a number 12 gauge wire. So again, I don't know what the capacity of a number 12 gauge wire is with three loops around it, but I'm assuming that that's what they're saying is that a 12 gauge wire with three loops within three inches can support 200 pounds. And so the ceiling joist or structure must be designed for that 200 pound load. Light fixtures inside the ceiling, if the light fixture weighs less than 10 pounds, so this little teeny light right here, uh, probably weighs definitely less than 10 pounds, we just provide one number 12 gauge safety wire. Now this is not a suspension wire, it's just a safety wire. Safety wire does not need to be taut, it just is a wire that would connect somewhere, wrap to the edge of this little uh, light fixture, connect it somewhere up to the structure, if the ceiling tile does happen to collapse or the light fixture pops loose when it moves, it'll just keep the light fixture from falling all the way to the floor. Now they never say how loose it can be, but I would assume it needs to be loose enough that it won't land on anybody's, uh, tight enough that it won't land on anybody's head, but we're not keeping it taut and suspending it. Now all the wires supporting the ceiling tile have to be taut, but the safety wire does not. If it weighs more than 10 pounds, but less than 56 pounds, in that situation, we're gonna use two number 12 gauge safety wires now instead of one. Again, they don't have to be taut. We're just gonna add two. So maybe these lights right here, they might weigh more than between 10 and 56 pounds and we'll have one at each corner. There is no clarification where those wires need to be, but I would recommend opposite corners. Once I exceed 56 pounds for my panel, now, the light fixture has to be supported directly from the structure. And so what this means is again, that it has to have taut wires, it has to, and they have to be designed to support the entire weight. And this will no longer be supported on the suspended ceiling grid system. Any services such as dis diffusers or speakers that might be located within the ceiling, uh, air terminals or other services if they weigh less than 20 pounds, will be directly attached to the main runner or cross runner. And so again, this one's out in the middle, that's not gonna be allowed. It has to be directly attached to a main runner or cross runner. If it's 20 pounds and between 20 and 56 pounds in weight, then it has to be directly attached to the suspension system. And so now it has to have directly have anchors going up to the ceiling 
and a minimum of two 12 gauge safety wires, again, not necessarily taut. Once I exceed 56 pounds, similar to the lights, it has to be directly supported from the structure and it will be independent from the bracing. So once again, now we'll have that three eighths of an inch gap around it. All right, any questions on the layout for seismic design category C before I jump into seismic design category D? We start a little late, so I'm running a little out of time, but I think I'll be able to get through most of, if not all of seismic design category D. I say D, but it applies as we know here to E and F as well. So now in addition to being engineered, ASCE 716 is gonna require that in seismic design categories D, E, and F, and again, like I said, in Northern Nevada, well, most of the areas I run into are here, in Southern Nevada, some of them are, are outside, might be in C. ASTM C635 and C636. Now it says I also have to meet E580, but now I'm going to go to Section 5, which is their section for higher limits. Again, Section 5 ASTM E580 is only providing the information that is minimum detailing requirements. I still have to meet any additional requirements from the engineering. Additionally, ASC7 goes and amends ASTM E580 and clarifies that perimeter support angles have minimum requirements and anything over 2,500 square feet is required to have a seismic joint. And so, like I said, in seismic design category C, we assumed the ceiling was just going to float and the rest of the building would stay standing and the ceiling would just wiggle back and forth and it would dissipate its energy by floating. The motion of the building would be minimalistic and that's how we would address it. In seismic design category D, we're now going to rigidly attach the ceiling to the wall elements or to the ceiling. We're gonna brace it in such a manner that it moves with the structure. So the walls go this way, the ceiling won't go this way, the wall and ceiling will move together. Once I get to a large ceiling area of 2,500 square feet or more, we might run into issues in which as the building begins to move, it may not be moving systematically together. One wall might be moving this way, one wall, wall might be moving that way. And now we would want seismic joints to allow that ceiling to flex so it's not breaking as it moves with the structure. Um, I don't like the way this is laid out. Just please be aware of this. This says 2,500 square feet. Well, is that 50 square feet by 50 square feet? What, how is this 2,500 measured? Um, be very careful as you're looking at that, okay? Um, what I would say is you're looking at this as 50 feet by 50 feet in a room, but what if I have a hallway down the middle of my building and uh, see if I find my mouse again. If I have a hallway down the center of my building and it looks like this, I have a long, narrow hallway well, the area of this hallway may be less than 2,500 square feet. Remember that 2,500 square feet is 50 by 50. This dimension in the long direction may exceed 50 feet. If this is greater than 50 feet, you may want to include, and again, the code doesn't say this, but you may want to put an expansion joint, a seismic joint in the center or at some location or every 50 feet linearly. Because again, as the building moves in this direction back and forth, we have more than 50 feet of ceiling. We have a long stretch of ceiling and it may start to compress or crash into it. If this wall is not moving at the same pace that this wall is moving in the building, now we could have some crush going on inside that, that, that ceiling and we could have damage. And so that's the intent of the expansion joint. Again, the limitation is 2,500 square feet, but be aware that the orientation may have some effect. So while the code requires this, I would recommend that you would look at and carefully advise anytime you exceed 50 feet in any direction. Again, I got that because 50 feet times 50 feet is 2,500.
The requirements, the change requirements for the perimeter support angle are stated as such. The support grid, main and cross runners, one end will now be attached. <coughs> so I said before in seismic design category C, we don't have anything. Now we have one side attached and the other side is free. Now the free end has to have before in seismic design category C was three eighths. Now we're going to double that. I need three quarters of an inch gap between the edge of my cross runner or my main runner and the wall. So now it's going to allow for a three quarter inch movement in both directions. The exception to this is an alternate qualified seismic clip, as long as it's been tested per ICC ESAC 156, that's the acceptance criteria or another approved testing standard. So as we look at that, what's going on here is we're gonna assume again, we have a two inch perimeter angle and we're gonna allow three quarter inches of movement. So it's gonna move one and a half inches in both directions. We have at least three quarters of an inch gap here and at least three quarters of an inch once it's on there and an extra quarter inch just for safety. So a two inch, I'm sorry, an extra half inch just for safety. We have a two inch clip and it moves back and forth. On one side, we're gonna fasten it in. So it moves with the system over here. We're gonna allow a little bit of flex in case, you know, allowing the building to catch up and have some movement. Once I start getting again, over 2,500 square feet, we would end up adding a suspend uh, a seismic joint out here to allow this to move. So on that side now, the expansion joint would be our free end and we would then fix it at both ends. The exception, we can have a smaller 7 eighths of an inch clip if we have a seismic clip in here. Now, the way the seismic clips work is the seismic clip will hook onto the wall on one side and then it'll have a free end where it can slide back and forth on the clip. If it slides off the angle, it moves off that seven eighths of an inch angle because I have to move three quarters of an inch. If it slips off the angle, the clip will keep the cross runner in place and prevent it from falling down. On the other side, we'll actually install a screw inside the clip into the main runner so it's still rigidly attached to the main runner and the cross runner. So one side will still be attached one side will be supported by just a free clip that slides back and forth. Installation again has to be done exactly per the listing for the clip. The suspension system, now we require heavy duty main T runners. So the T runners have to, have to be heavy duty. And this requires that they now have at least 180 pounds in compression force. Now, remember that number 180 pounds, we'll talk about it briefly uh, uh, in this as we talk about the importance of engineering. The suspension system itself again goes on. We're going to have the perimeter angle that I said has to be two, two inches minimum with three quarter inch gap. Number 12 wire within eight inches of the wall. One end will be fixed and one end is going to be free and a three quarter inch gap at the free end. Again, like seismic design category C, I want to prevent my parallel lines from splitting apart. And so I will have to have a spreader bar or something else that's there. Again, the seismic clip. Uh, has an option where you can screw the clip into the wall. So, so as the clip's coming in, it'll screw into the wall and that will provide your, uh, your it replace the spreader bar and it also eliminates the need for the pop rivet coming down here if you're screwed in and screwed into the wall. And so you won't even see it. That, that's again, if that's part of the clip, but something has to prevent them again from spreading apart from each other at the ends. The stabilizer bar must be located at least 60 inches on center maximum and within 24 inches of the end wall. And then the suspension wire is gonna be the same as the code before, a maximum capacity of 200 pounds, three, three wraps tightly within three inches. Now, in addition to bracing it to each wall, as we said, we're gonna brace everything to each wall and attach it. In seismic design category D, C, we just let it float up there. Now we're going to have it have the system. We have to have a bracing system. We have to have a lateral brace connected and the minimum spacing for the lateral brace. Now, ASCE 7 is going to say that ceiling areas greater than 1,000 square feet require bracing. ASC 716 said that anything over 144 square feet needs to have engineering. And so now the question comes down to, oh, well, what about bracing? 
do I need to have bracing if it's, what if it's less than a thousand square feet, but more than 144 square feet? If the engineer of record determines that bracing is not necessary, then bracing is not necessary. But anything over 144 square feet requires engineering. So I don't know if I recommend this, but in most jurisdictions, as long as you meet the detailing requirements of ASTM, ASTM E580, they don't require engineering. Now that's not always the best practice because how do you size the compression strut? and everything else, but that's that's what happens in a lot of jurisdictions. So just be aware of that. But ASE 7 is gonna require seismic engineering over 144 square feet. This is going to govern over the fact that bracing is only mandated for ceilings over a thousand square feet, but they still have to be engineered. And if they're not braced with this brace, then the engineer has to determine how they are braced. Horizontal restraints, is what this is. These are the horizontal restraints are done with these splay wires. And so they have to have four number 12 splay wires in each one in each direction. And they need to be located within two inches of a cross runner, splayed 90 degrees from each other, extending up the ceiling at a 45 degree angle maximum from the horizontal. So we're gonna cross this out. And this is gonna prevent this from moving. If, if, the, if it wants to try to move in this direction, this wire will prevent it from moving. If it moves in this direction, this wire will prevent it from moving. If it tries to go this way, this one will move, resist, et cetera. So there's one in each direction and 90 degree angles all the way around preventing this from moving. Uh, as it goes to move in this direction, this wire goes tight. The ceiling wants to go up. The compression strut is going to be provided a vertical strut, which will prevent the ceiling from lifting up at that location. So that's how this bracing system works. Again, this is a prescriptive bracing requirement for any ceiling over a thousand square feet. If it's less than a thousand square feet, the engineer is gonna to need to dictate what the bracing methodology is. Even if it's over a thousand square feet, you really should look at whether or not an engineer should design it. Brace, again, technically per code, it does always have to be engineered. These braces must be a minimum of a 12 feet on center in each direction and located within six feet of the wall. So again, remember, I have to have a vertical wire within two feet of the wall and every four feet on center. Plus I have to have an additional support, vertical support within eight inches of the wall in size of design category D, and then coming out 12 feet. So six feet and six feet from the wall, I now have my splay wires and my compression strut at this circle location, and then 12 feet again, and 12 feet again. So every four feet, a vertical wire, every 12 feet, four splay wires and a compression strut. There are additional bracing requirements within six inches of any duct or piping supported by a grid. Now this is almost always missing from the architectural drawing, so please be aware of it. If you have any duct or pipe sticking into uh, return airs that's supported by the grid system, you have to have a seismic brace within six inches. Uh, you have to have a brace there, and those bracing wires have to be designed for at least 250 pounds. Any changes in elevation, if I have ceilings at different heights, each level has to be braced independently. Cable trays, electric cable trays have to be independently braced. They can't be part of support on the ceiling. Sprinkler heads and penetrations require a two inch oversized ring, allowing for one inch free movement in any direction. Um, or we can have one inch free movement in all directions or alternately I can have a flexible pipe that allows it to move at least one inch in any direction. The separation joint, like I said, is required 2,500 square feet. The area, now ASCE 7, I told you ASCE 7 doesn't say anything. A ASTM E580 does tell you the area for short to long ratio shall be a lot less than four. And so this does come in and say that if I have that long skinny ceiling that we talked about before down my corridor, that it's gonna come in and say, hey, if my corridor, see if I can find my pin here. If my corridor is five feet wide, my maximum spacing is four times that. So this is four times 
whatever that number is, X. So this would be limited at 20 feet before I'd have to have spacing. And so be aware that's only 100 square feet, but it's going to limit your short side and long side ratio of less than four. And then it must allow for at least a three quarter inch gap in each area. And a closure angle will be provided at that gap. Again, looking at the, the connection, we can see down here, let me pull up my little arrow. So these are various clips that might be done. This is a clip that allows these to slide three quarters of an inch in each direction. Here we have a closure angle and then a free end that slides back and forth. Some other options are a four-way seismic joint that clips over the top and allows movement in each direction. Light fixtures. Fixtures that must be attached now to the grid, so I have to attach to the grid system. So here it spans from cross main, grid, main runner to main runner. Here, because it doesn't go to the main runner, I have to put a grid on each corner unless it has an independent support. So if I want a can light in the center, I would have to have an independent system to support that can light. The fixture weight and must be less than the design capacity of the grid. So if the fixture weighs 50 pounds, the grid has to be designed to support a 50 pound light fixture. If the grid has a capacity of less than 16 pounds per square feet, then the supplemental wires have to support the light. So if the light isn't strong enough, then I have to have supplemental wires at each corner to support the light fixture. Other requirements are going to be, as we saw in seismic design category C. So again, this is going to be the one or two safety wires connecting the light and anything over 56 pounds, regardless, has to be independently supported. Partition walls, the walls shall not be braced to the ceiling grid system. So the wall has to be independently braced. Any walls over six feet in height must be braced directly to structure. And deflection for the brace walls shall not exceed the ceiling deflection. So technically, the engineer should provide a calculation showing that the walls will not deflect more than the spacing. Um, there was a question, I'm sorry, I missed it, it came in a little earlier. That said, do the ASTM E580 requirements apply to suspended gypsum board ceilings? They do not, Eric. If you are using a gyps ceiling that's suspended or a cloud ceiling is another one I see all the time. Cloud ceilings have to be engineered, but the detailing requirements of ASTM E580 would not apply. The engineer of record would need to create a design. So any suspended ceiling other than acoustic tiles is just going to be engineered. There are no minimum detailing requirements. Again, this is kind of where things fall apart. E580 is a prescriptive system. It's not really engineered. So technically, the code says, hey, you meet both the detailing requirements of E580 and it has to be engineered. But most jurisdictions, like I say, if you meet the detailing requirements, they kind of close their eyes to the engineering requirement. If you're not in a suspended ceiling because you don't have those detailing requirements for an acoustic ceiling from E580, now you're 100% reliant on an engineer. The engineer would need to provide how that system is braced and supported and what those details would be. Ceiling penetration. So here I have a picture. You can kind of maybe see it in the corner of my room uh, in my that I'm doing the presentation from. This is a steel column supporting the roof. These are non-bearing walls here, and the structural, any structural elements penetrating the system or any independently braced elements. So this includes light fixtures. If I had a light fixture popped in the middle here um, that was seismically independently braced, shall be treated as walls and provided with a perimeter angle. So this is not correct. You can't just notch around it. There should be a perimeter angle coming around that device so that we have support on all four sides around that structural element. Drawings and specifications. Now the code, I said, didn't say anything before, but now the codes, the standard says that on the construction documents, you must show all suspended ceiling systems, provide the details for supports, and details for how the lateral bracing is to be done. Conflicts between the standard and the code shall comply with the code requirements and the code governs. So again, ASC 716 is going to govern over ASTM E580. So just an example, as I said, these need to be engineered. Seismic force requirements of ASE 7, if you were to engineer a ceiling 
how will the engineer do it? What they're going to say is the weight of the ceiling must be calculated at at least four pounds per square foot. That's the minimum weight. Doesn't matter if your ceiling weighs less than this, you have to use four. If your ceiling weighs more than four PSF, you would do so. This is the same for gypsum ceilings, cloud ceilings, acoustic tiles. This is the requirement ASC 7 for any suspended ceiling system. It also includes the weights from any lights, panels, or other equipment supported by your ceiling. Anything and anything that's not supported by the walls themselves. You would calculate a seismic force. Now, a seismic force is a horizontal force. There's also a vertical component for the seismic force. And that seismic force that you calculate for your ceiling must be transferred into a structural element. So not a non-bearing interior wall. It has to somehow get transferred into the floor diaphragm or into a shear wall or a moment frame system or some sort of vertical lateral force resisting system. And this is done through attachments from the ceiling to a structural force resisting element. Details become critical. Number one problem I see is when I'm using ASTM E580, the compression strut. There's no detail for how the compression strut attaches to the ceiling and how it attaches to the roof. What size screw is there? How does that thing attach to the metal deck above? Those details need to be provided on the plans. Here's how you would calculate the seismic force. You take the weight of the ceiling material, which is a minimum of four PSF, and you throw it in this beautiful equation right here. This is what the engineer record is doing but the force is not required to be larger than this, nor is it allowed to be less than this. So ASC 716 calculates those numbers that we see in here. We have A sub P, we have R sub P. This SDS is based on your seismic location. A sub P and R sub P are calculated as for suspended ceilings, they're one and 2.5. The importance factor is 1.0, except in risk category four structures. There's a 50% increase in the seismic force. That's that 1.5 for a risk category four. So if you're designing a hospital, I strongly, strongly recommend that all hospitals be engineered. Anything that's a risk category four structure, a police station, et cetera, provide structural engineering. And here is my simple example. I have a house out in West Point, Utah. And the calculations for my house, the A sub P is one, the R sub P is 2.5. The importance factor is 1.0 for a house. If I were to put suspended ceilings in there, the minimum weight is four pounds. So using the minimum weight, this is the site specific seismic acceleration for my house, 0.78. If I assume that the height of my ceiling is approximately the height of the roof, so it's a little conservative there, the equation I come up with is 0 0.4 times 1 times 0 0.78 plus 1 plus 2 over 4 times 4 divided by 2.5, which accounts to 1.5 PSF. That's 40% of the gravity load, 40 pounds gravity, 1.5 pounds per square foot horizontal force acting on my ceiling tile. If I were to brace it at the 144 square foot minimum required by ASTM E580, my horizontal members would have a capacity force of 215 pounds. Diagonal braces would be braced at 305 pounds and the vertical compression start would have to resist 250 pounds of force. So that's more than I weigh. So essentially, if I were to stand on the ceiling tile, it needs to be able to support my weight, the compression strut. So that little conduit going up the ceiling, I should be able to stand on it, me, and it would not collapse under my weight. So this would not be three quarter inch metal conduit extending for four feet. It's probably gonna be a steel stud. Remember that the heavy duty braces are only required to resist 180 pounds of tension or compression. So 250, 15 pounds of horizontal force may exceed the capacity of some of the T-grid systems. So I may not be able to meet that T-grid requirement at 144 on center. And the diagonal brace is 305 pounds. Well, it's a number 12 gauge wire with three twists. Code doesn't tell me how much that is. I'd have to calculate it but it says that the structural element has to only be capable of resisting 200 pounds. So my assumption is that wire only resists 200 pounds. So this will probably rip apart the wire. So for my house, 
the standard detailing requirements of ASTM E580 probably are insufficient for the calculated forces. If they were to build a hospital or risk category four structure building, these would all be increased by 50%. The gravity load would now be 400, the diagonal load would now be 450 pounds. The horizontal force would now be 300 pounds. Um, the vertical load as well, 300 pounds. And so as you begin to see that this would not function at the minimum 144 spacing on center. So please, please be aware that especially in risk category 1.4 uh, structures, just meeting the detailing requirements of ASTM E580 may not be adequate. And the code does require for all ceilings that they are engineered. So that's the end of the presentation. I'm sorry I took a little bit over. We did start a little late. Hopefully I'm not too far into your break and you'll have enough time to uh, run and hit the bathroom or get a drink, get some coffee in you before you head out to the next class. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, uh, my, let me switch back to the front of the slide so you can see my contact information in case, in case you want to send me. I don't know if we'll have time to answer any questions here in the class. So let me let me swing back and I'll get this first slide up there. There's my contact information right there. If you do want to send me an email or a phone call with any questions you may have on this subject. But thank you for your attendance today. Please enjoy the rest of your classes. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much, Todd. And folks, just so you know, we will have a break now till 3.30. Uh, you'll have to log back into the main session during the break. So we ask that you do that now before uh, you do take your, way, your break away from the computer. Uh, the link to the main session is the one that you used this morning to launch uh, to join in the first place. So if you go back to your emails that uh, from this morning where you got a reminder, just click that and join that session and then go on break just so that you'll be here and ready to go. Um, if you all do have any questions, you have the AVD live uh, team here who will help you um, get over to the next site as well. Um, thank you all again. And thank you again, Todd, for your time. We appreciate it.